Dorothy Jane Scott was born on April 23rd, 1948. At the time of our story, she is located in Stanton, California. The year is 1980. By all accounts, she was close to her family, yet remained independent. Her parents still lived in Anaheim, and she worked two jobs in this small town. One of the shops she worked in was called Swinger Psych Shop, and the other was a head shop called Custom John's. She persistently followed a set routine, which involved dropping her son Sean, otherwise known as Shanty, off at her parents when attending to work commitments. Everyone that knew her described her as introverted, responsible and methodical. Some have even gone so far as to call her quite boring. She was not a partaker of alcohol or drugs, and was seen by most to be a homebird, who preferred isolation and spending time with her son to social environments. Be this as it may, the strange actions of another would begin to alter her life in the early months of 1980. It all began with strange phone calls she received from an unknown man, who at first appeared simply obsessed by the demure mother. She told those closest to her about the calls, stating that she recognised the voice, though could not place it with anyone in particular. Many in subsequent years have said it had to have been an acquaintance with whom she had exchanged a few words. The subject matter of the calls differed each time he rang. Sometimes he confessed his love for her, at other times he would issue threats to kill. From these calls, it became apparent that he did not simply confine his interactions with her to verbal exchanges over the phone. While talking to her, he would tell her what she was wearing, who she had been talking to, and what she had done on any given day. On one call he said, and I quote, I saw that man in the shop today. Is he your lover? If he is, he will suffer the same fate as you. Another call said, I got you a present, Dorothy. Look outside, Dorothy. I think you'll like it. On inquiry, Dorothy noticed a dead rose placed on her windshield. The most frightening call came when he remarked, You're going to come my way, and when I get you alone, I will cut you up into tiny pieces so no one will ever find you. In the aftermath of these calls, she told her mother she was disconcerted and scared. However, she put the remarks down as nothing other than a sick joke. She did contemplate buying a gun, but decided against this due to her reservations. She also didn't want a firearm in the same house as her four-year-old son. Instead, she opted for karate lessons and began them the week before her disappearance. On the day she went missing, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Sean was dropped off at his grandparents' house and Dorothy made her way to work. A staff meeting was due to take place at 9pm, so she had informed her parents that she would be later than usual. The day passed and she made her way to the meeting room with her colleagues. While the meeting was underway, one of those present, Conrad Bastron, took ill. Dorothy offered to bring him to the hospital. Conrad accepted her offer, and another woman, Pam Head, went with them. While on their way, she stopped at her parents' house and informed them about her change of plan. The only thing she did while at home was change the black scarf she had been wearing that day for a red one. She then hurriedly said bye. She closed her parents' front door behind her and made her way back to the car. The three then proceeded to make their way to UC Irvine Medical Centre. On arrival, they helped Conrad out of the car and walked to admissions. 
He was quickly attended to by medical staff, and the two women sat in the waiting room, making small talk and browsing a number of magazines. It soon transpired that Conrad had been bitten by a black widow spider. After he'd been treated, he left the company of medical staff with a prescription in his hand. It was around 11pm by all accounts. While his prescription was being filled out, Dorothy went to the restroom and on returning, said she would go to her car and bring it around to the front entrance so that Conrad wouldn't have to make the trip to where it had been parked. Shortly after, Conrad and Pam made their way to the front exit and expected to see Dorothy waiting. She wasn't. They stayed there for 20 minutes and were overjoyed when they saw her Toyota station wagon coming towards them. However, they soon realised that the car was moving at an unusually strange speed, with its headlights blinding the two. It would speed straight past them and leave the hospital grounds. Both stood alarmed at what they had witnessed. Dorothy was, after all, a calm and gentle person. Yet the car being driven looked more like it was being piloted by someone who had lost their mind. In later accounts, they said they couldn't see who was in the car because they were blinded by the lights and the car was moving so fast. Rather than phone someone else, both waited for Dorothy's return for two hours. They then decided to call her parents to see if she had made it home. As we know, she hadn't. On being notified that Dorothy had not returned home, they called police, reported her missing and informed them of the strange events. At first, police were not overly concerned. But that changed when a car was discovered in Santa Ana, around 10 miles away, parked in an alleyway at 4.30am, a mere five hours after she had last been seen. The car had been set on fire by someone, and police knew it was not likely to have been Dorothy. I have a few questions about the account of what happened after they had left the front entrance and then seen Dorothy's car hurtling out, but I will put them aside for now and continue on with a retelling of the events after this strange night. In the days, months and years after Dorothy's disappearance, family and police toiled to find answers. No answers were forthcoming. Rather than resolutions, they experienced a shift in the kidnappers' attention. With Dorothy not around, calls started to be made to her mother, Vera Scott. Every Wednesday afternoon, he would call claiming Dorothy was alive, or that he had killed her. This happened every week for four years. The calls were always short and made when Jacob Scott was out of the house. Police tapped the phone with the family's permission. The caller never stayed on long enough for them to be tracked, but they did record each call. His voice is described as gruff and vague and purposefully disguised. To this day, the recording has not been released to the public, and as far as we know it, it has never been identified. Police failure to release the recording is puzzling, but it aligns with their conduct during the preliminary investigation. For example, even though they had few leads, they advised Jacob Scott to keep news of the events out of the limelight. What motivation did they have for this? They have a female who has been kidnapped and they are not using one of their best outlets, namely asking if anybody saw or heard anything untoward on the night she was taken. As for the recording, the case has been cold for over 40 years. One would think that after a number of years with no interesting leads, they would release a partial recording to see if anyone close to the kidnapper recognised his voice or his manner of speaking. Jacob Scott would dismiss advice given by police and go to the media for information. He contacted the Orange County Register a week after her disappearance. On the day they released an article outlining some of the details of that night. The editor of the newspaper 
Pat Riley, received a phone call from the presumed kidnapper. In that call, he uttered the following words. I killed her. I killed Dorothy Scott. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. He also volunteered certain pieces of information only the kidnapper would know. He stated that Dorothy had been wearing a red scarf and was at the hospital with a colleague who had sustained a spider bite. He also indicated that he had talked to Dorothy by phone when she was at the hospital with Pam and Conrad. Dorothy's family and friends were bemused at the insinuations made by the caller. They were adamant Dorothy didn't have any love interests in her life. She didn't have the time. As far as they were concerned, it only indicated further that the kidnapper was living in a fictional world of his own making. I will talk more about the alleged call he made to Dorothy later. The continued calls do raise a number of questions. Why would the killer continue to call Vera Scott? Did he have a grudge against the Scots? Was it simply a psychopath's way of maintaining a sense of control? Or was he feeding his chronic obsession for Dorothy? There's a possibility that the kidnapper worked in the same shop as Dorothy. It's also known that Jacob Scott was a previous owner of the Swinger Psych Shop where she worked. And from our research, it has been said he still had a partial stake in the enterprise. The kidnapper could therefore be a disgruntled employee. He could have been someone who had a run-in with Jacob. He may well have been fired. One can only assume investigators followed up on these possibilities. One thing we know is that these taunting calls went on for four years, until one day he changed his usual pattern of calling when he knew Vera was at home. On this day, he called in the evening and Jacob answered the phone and told the caller he had the wrong number. The calls came to a stop. The halting of calls certainly seems to suggest that he possibly knew Jacob and was worried that he might be identified. This would indicate more than just a passing familiarity. Police didn't have anything to go on. Nobody had seen Dorothy in the car with anyone. Nobody saw her car being driven. Nobody saw it being parked and then set on fire. And therefore no arrests were made. They did question the father of Sean, Dennis Terry. But he was living in Missouri at the time of her disappearance. Another name continually pops up when searching this case and we were not sure if we would mention him. But he has been named by Dorothy's son in subsequent years. That man is Mike Butler. He worked as a mechanic in a premises next door to Swinger's psych shop. His sister also worked with Dorothy at the same location. Most of the allegations seem to stem from what people perceived as strange characteristics. There is also a lot of talk regarding his religious practices. Apparently, he had an interest in the occult. Neither one of these things should matter, and for this reason I will simply dismiss them. What is of interest is his proximity to her location. He may well have been able to track her movements, in a way that would explain how he was able to detail everything, from the clothes she was wearing to the people she was talking to. Though this is an interesting line of inquiry that police may have utilised, there is nothing linking him to the disappearance of Dorothy, and he wasn't even named as a suspect or person of interest. It's reported he died in 2014. Remains were unearthed on August 6th, 1984, on Santa Ana, Canyon Road. At first, the operator of heavy machinery believed it was dog bones, 
and it was. But on closer inspection, he noticed the unmistakable contours of a human skull. It later turned out that the human remains had been buried underneath the remains of a dog, quite possibly the killer's. Other items were found at the location, including a turquoise ring and watch. The watch still had the date, May 29th, 1980 on it. This instantly drew the attention of police. They also noticed that the watch had come to a halt at 12.30am, only one hour after Dorothy's car had gone speeding past Conrad and Pam. Before the body was formally identified, Dorothy's mother Vera confirmed both the ring and watch had belonged to her daughter. A week later, dental records settled the matter. Both of her parents said they were both heartbroken and relieved. Their four-year ordeal had reached a conclusion. They could get on with raising their grandson. However, the caller, kidnapper and killer would try one last time to get under the skin of Dorothy's family. While they were in the process of making funeral arrangements, another call was made to her house. On this occasion, her brother answered the phone and was again taunted. When researching the case, we came across information that didn't sit right from the get-go. And that information came from the two people who went to the hospital with her. Conrad Bastron and Pam Head. In comments made to the police and media, they stated that on seeing that Dorothy was not where she was supposed to be, they waited 20 minutes at the entrance of the hospital. Does anyone else think this is strange? Think of a normal reaction to such a situation. You might be a little irritated, but after a few minutes of waiting around, wanting to get home, surely you would go in search of Dorothy and her car. It said that Dorothy walked into the hospital with them, so both would have known where the car was parked. Instead, they waited around while Dorothy was likely already in the presence of her soon-to-be killer. Another aspect of their story that doesn't add up is their statements regarding what they did when they saw her Toyota speed past them. They stood around for two hours, believing she might return. This appears to me implausible. I'd go so far as to say they clearly weren't the sharpest. Why would anybody who had witnessed what they had witnessed stand around dumbfounded for two hours before calling to see if she had arrived at her parents to pick up her son? When they did ring her parents, they called from a payphone in the hospital. And on being told she hadn't returned, they called the police. How long before you realise she isn't coming back? How long does it take for one of them to have that eureka moment. You know what, let's use the payphone. Another aspect of the story worth commenting on involves the killer's conversation with the newspaper editor. In it, he relayed that he had talked to Dorothy. Pam contradicts this piece of information. She stated, and I quote, Dorothy never left her side. We have to assume the killer was creating this piece of information. Maybe it's a further sign of delusion. It's certainly something we can't confirm one way or another. However, one thing I was able to discover when looking through newspaper articles related to the case was an early description of the events on the night Dorothy disappeared. In this article, Pam Head says that when the car went past her and Conrad, Another car followed it out. This is really strange, because there is never a mention of this car in subsequent articles. And yet, it would have to be considered an extremely important detail. Especially when you look at where Dorothy's body and car were found. Her body was found around 15 miles away from her car. This would mean that the killer 
would have had to bring her body to Santa Ana Canyon Road, then drive her car back to the alley where it was left and then burnt. He must have followed her to the hospital in something, maybe a taxi, but no taxi driver has ever came forward to offer information on a man that asked him to follow a Toyota station wagon. One has to presume he followed her to the hospital, parked his car, confronted her, kidnapped her, used her car, dumped her body, drove it to the location where it was found and then made his way back to the hospital. Again, he may have got a taxi back to the hospital, but surely taxi drivers would have been asked to provide details of a man being picked up near the location of the car and possibly driven back to the hospital. Another thing, let's not forget the trailing car. Did the kidnapper have an accomplice? If we take Pam's word in one of the first newspaper articles, it seems like a possibility at least. But why is there no mention of this detail again? Did she change her story or did police fail to follow it up? With all the time that has gone by, we will likely never know. And that is extremely frustrating. There are so many loose ends in this case and a lot of them come from the descriptions given by Conrad and Pam. We're not trying to insinuate they had anything to do with the disappearance and murder, but what is going on with their stories? They defy comprehension. As well as some of the confusing details given by Pam and Conrad, one has to question the actions of the police. Why didn't they circulate the circumstances of Dorothy's disappearance from the beginning? They clearly had no leads. Lastly, why haven't they released the caller's voice? What harm would it have done when all of the routes to finding the caller had been exhausted? There's no doubt it's a strange case and questions arise continually while researching it. We'll leave many of them to the audience to speculate on. One thing we do know is that Sean never got to know his mother who by all accounts was loving, industrious and deeply committed to providing her son with all the things he needed to succeed in the world. Her parents, who had to deal with a merciless and deluded killer, never got to see justice done. Jacob passed away in 1994 and Vera followed him eight years later in 2002. Unfortunately, this amongst all the cases we've covered, appears to be a hopelessly cold case. One can only hope that Sean has learned to deal with the trauma of such an event. Thanks to everyone once again for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe to Mystery Scope. Until the next time, Take care.